Today we're in a series called I'm Struggling, because I think lots of people are. And we're going to talk today about I'm struggling with, with uh, isolation. Before we go into that, what I would like to do is to pray for you. And um, uh, what I've been doing in this season is, uh, I'm not, this prayer is not about, I hope my message does really well and you enjoy it. Uh, this is something, a prayer for you, given the context of the season we're in or the week we're in. And so what I'd like to do right now is if you just bow your heads and allow words to work their way into your heart and your mind. Uh, Father, your servant, the Apostle Paul, once told us not to worry about anything. There are days when that's harder. But it wasn't just a command without an option to exercise. You told us that rather than worry, to convert those worries into prayers and to pray about everything and to come to you and tell you what we need and to come to you and thank you for what we have. And your, your wisdom indicates that when we do those things, something interrupts the worry cycle in our minds, that peace begins to seep into our soul. And it acts like a guard for our hearts and our minds. And then you tell us one more thing. You tell us to focus, focus, fix our thoughts on things that are true and things that are honorable, and things that are right, and things that are pure, and things that are lovely, and things that are admirable. Father, it is so easy to look at things that are none of those. Would you help us focus on things that are excellent and things that are worthy of praise? Would you help us to take our eyes off what is broken and ugly and put our eyes on what is beautiful and whole? And out of that confidence and grace to carry light into dark places where so many need so much from you. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a lot of people who are uh, struggling as a result of the season that we're in, particularly related to COVID. There's a lot more separation. There's a lot more isolation. A lot of the things that we used to do to regularly connect and get together is kind of offline. And so the question is, does scripture have anything to say about that? And the answer is a lot. And we're going to look at one of the most interesting characters in all of the Bible. Uh, this guy would absolutely have more followers on social media than anybody we know. He would have his own reality TV show and uh, he would be one of the most popular characters on the planet. His name is Elijah. And we're going to read in 1 Kings chapter 19, Ahab, who was king at that time, told Jezebel, who was his wife, everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. By the way, Jezebel would also have her own uh, TV show. <laughs> she would have done very well in our culture. Yeah. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. And while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head 
was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and then lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. In case you're wondering, this is the same mountain that Moses was on when he received the commandments. There he went into a cave and spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword, and I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart, shattered rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They put your prophets to death with a sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazel, Hazel, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, or whose mouths have not kissed him. It's a, it is a really complicated story. I'm not kidding. I could talk the rest of the day about this, but don't worry, I'm not. I'll start with this though. Loneliness is more of a common denominator than an outlier. It is actually common to feel separated and divided from others. We all experience times when we feel like we're not able to connect with other people on a deeper level. And sometimes we start thinking that's because there's something wrong with us. And we enter into a kind of self, self-loathing um, in our culture, you can go on social media and they say that if you connect with another person, that's called a friend. I will tell you there's more to being a friend than clicking confirm on an option. And unfortunately, we, we have surrendered to a notion that if I spend some time on social media platforms, I'm connected with other people. You're aware of what's going on in their lives, but it's not the same as being connected. A five minute conversation on a phone right now will do more for you than a five hour surfing of various social media platforms to see how your friends are doing. Um, so, it's a little bit of a surprise that you actually don't have to be alone to feel alone. You can be in this room today and actually feel alone. If you feel like you don't have something in common with the people who are around you, you will feel alone. If you feel like someone doesn't notice you, you will feel alone. If you feel like you're not really known by someone, you will feel alone. If you feel like people don't agree with you, you will feel alone. You feel like you don't belong. That's very isolating. And COVID hasn't caused this, but it's actually accelerated this. We're, we're, we're getting a more distilled sense of this in our world and in our lives. 
And our culture has some basic um, responses, kind of platitudes and, and, and cliches that they'll throw out. Well, you just need to put yourself out there. You need to take a few more risks. And, and, and what they're basically saying is just act a little more extroverted and then friends will come to you. Uh, that kind of suggests that extroverts never feel lonely, which they do. And maybe even more so right now since they have less options to get together with others. Lots of extroverts can feel lonely too. So the people in scripture actually struggled often with loneliness. They had less uh, uh, opportunity to connect with others in certain seasons than even we do in this one. And there's a lot of wisdom that we can find that goes way beyond the culture's cliches of just put yourself out there, try to act a little bit more like an extrovert and see if you can't make more friends. And Elijah is one of these people. Uh, he, he goes into a season of intense isolation and it, it piggybacked with a depth of depression to the point he didn't want to live anymore. This is one of the great prophets in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, there comes a moment where on a mountain, it's called the Mount of Transfiguration, where two people appear from the Old Testament to represent the Old Testament with Jesus. And one is Moses who gave the law, and one is Elijah, which is really fascinating because Elijah never wrote anything. We don't have a book of Elijah. Isaiah, long book. Jeremiah, two books. Some prophets even got a postcard out. Very short and brief, but they said something. Elijah didn't write anything. And even more than that, when he preached, his messages averaged between 16 and 25 words. I know, you're asking, why can't you be more like him? Be careful what you ask for. So how do we get to this situation? Well, it was one of the great throwdowns in human history. Elijah was a prophet of God, and he had challenged the prophets of Baal to a kind of competition. Baal was an idol in that area of the world, and it actually was the god of rain, and Asherah was kind of the god of fertility, and these were combined together. And so the competition was this. Both sides will build an altar and both sides will put a sacrifice on the altar and both sides will ask God to send fire and consume the sacrifice. And the God that answers by fire, everybody's going to worship that God, whoever wins this competition. And uh, I wish I had time just to go into the story of how that competition unfolded. But what wound up happening is uh, the God of Elijah answered by fire. And the people who were there fell to their knees and fell on the ground. And it's amazing, it's amazing how many people believe that if they saw a supernatural event like that, they would have more faith and others would become believers. And I wish it were true. It was a spectacular event, but not everyone was convinced. And one of those people was Jezebel, the king's wife. She did not want a new God. She wanted control. So she sent a messenger to Elijah. Within 24 hours, you're a dead man. I have the resources, the power, and the ability to make that happen. And he took off running. It can be devastating when a miracle of God doesn't seem to make the difference you hoped for. This is not a, a message that says miracles aren't available and they're not present. They are. But sometimes we assume if God does what you want, then you will get what you want. And those two things are not always compatible thoughts. So he takes off running. He left his servant in Beersheba, which is an interesting thing. It's a sign that he's giving up. I really don't need any help anymore because I'm not doing anything anymore. He also could have been concerned about the safety of the servant. If someone's coming after me, I don't want this person who served me really well to be killed in the process. When we're struggling with depression, it's amazing how often we assume that getting away from someone will be better for them. And so Elijah walked a whole day into the wilderness. He didn't plan on coming back. He finally stops and drops down underneath a broom bush and he asked God to end, end his life. In that spot, 
He took his expectations that things would be different, and he took his expectations about himself, and he quietly buried his broken expectations underneath that broom bush, and he fell asleep hoping he would never wake up again. Now, what I'm about to tell you is likely to frustrate almost everybody in the room for different reasons. There are some people who really get frustrated and think that the only real options to getting healthier or better in life are some kind of religious action that you take. You just need to pray, or you just need to read the Bible, or you just need to show up in church. And if you do that, your life will be better. All of those things are good, but they don't always accomplish what we desire. And then there are other people who they just poo-poo the whole concept that anything spiritual, spiritually dynamic has any real influence in anyone's life. That this is just a game people play to keep traditions and stay connected and, and it doesn't really affect anything. And what I will tell you is if, if you gravitate to either one of those things, this next section is going to frustrate you. We're going to talk about God's prescription for dealing with loneliness and for working your way back out of some of the depression that comes from that. And the first thing, it's surprising, the first thing is rest. Rest. Take a nap. Sleep in. Someone said amen? How many more amens can we get? All right? Somebody says, yeah, you say that now, but what if I took a nap right now? Go for it. You wouldn't be the first. You won't be the last. We have people in our church that play my messages, and it puts their children to sleep. That's a fact. So, no, rest. No lecture, no sermon, no advice to start. The truth is, is that you were not designed to function without rest. You may try, but every part of your being will disintegrate when you are exhausted. You are not the exception to the rule. Only God doesn't need to sleep. The Bible says he never sleeps, he never slumbers, and you are not him. Sleep deprivation is one of the biggest things that's affecting our culture right now. And we think that it has no impact on us because we can caffeinate ourselves up and show up ready to go. And rest. He just lays down and he sleeps. Second thing, I know this is going to surprise you. Eat. <laughs> if you can, eat good food which is not the same thing as eating fast food. An angel built a fire and baked some bread over hot coals, coals and, and he brings a jug filled with water. And he woke up Elijah and he tells him to eat. And Elijah eats and he drinks and he goes back to sleep. And, and the angel lets him rest. And then he wakes him up again. Get, say, Come on, have some more to eat and some more to drink. You need to eat good food. Oh. Our country struggles with healthy diets. And there are people who just throw all caution to the wind and, and eat whatever's cheapest and, and most available. And other people basically starve themselves to try to accommodate some BMI, body mass index number that they've been told either by someone in their life or by a cover of a magazine or something on their screens which they look at, that this is how humans are supposed to look. Can I tell you something? Even those humans don't look like that. If it wasn't for Photoshop, none of them would be on the screen. Eat. Eat some good food. Enjoy a good meal. Some of you are here this morning and you're going, I'm so glad I came today. I'm going to go home and I'm going to take a nap and I'm going to eat some good food. Third, walk. He's going to walk for 40 days. 40 days is a long time to walk. A sedentary lifestyle is an accelerant to loneliness. The more you don't move, the more likely you are to feel alone. And it would take a lot more than one walk around the block to fix this. It took 40 days of moving to get Elijah where he needed to be geographically, physically, and emotionally. 
You don't have to run. You don't have to be a marathon sprinter. You don't have to climb a mountain. If you want to, go for it. But get up and move. Just getting less amens now. <laughs> and then Elijah climbs the same mountain where Moses met with God, and he found a cave, and he spends the night. And this is where God begins to interact with Elijah. We think we're ready to hear what God has to say, and that's often not true. God wasn't waiting or trying to figure out something to say to Elijah that would help. God was waiting until he was ready to hear it. And the fourth thing is, God actually begins with questions. What are you doing here, Elijah? Isn't it amazing we read this story over and over and we miss these things because we want to get to the part where God gives specific direction. But there's a process that God had to bring Elijah through to work through his loneliness and his depression. What are you doing here? And he said, I've been passionate for you. Your people have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars. The people you sent to call them back, they killed. I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me too. And now is when God begins to speak. Go out and stand in the mountain in the presence of the Lord. I'm about to pass by. So he's standing there in a violent wind. Now, I know we've seen things like tornadoes and hurricanes and the damage they can do. We, our, our neighborhood that we live in has a natural wind tunnel as a result of a tree line and a pond that goes behind all the houses on our street. And the wind flows down there, and when it's a strong wind, I mean, there's lots of stuff that it has picked up. We, we have a metal wrought iron table on our deck. Twice it has picked that up and hurled it off of our deck and into the neighbor's lawn. I've had to go drag that thing back. It's dented on one side because of the damage of wind. Our neighbors put in a pool, an above ground pool. The wind came through. I've never seen anything like it. It tore that pool apart with the water in it. I was standing there watching as it finally got to the place where the water just all, there, it shredded it. They put a new pool in its place that's reinforced in ways it has survived the wind tunnel. A violent wind comes, but God was not in the wind. An earthquake shook the ground. God's not in the earthquake. A fire incinerates everything in its path. God's not in the fire. What's happening? God is challenging an assumption, and it's an assumption we need to have challenged in our life. Our assumption is he is either in or he is responsible for the disasters and the destruction that occurs around us. Something bad happens, whether they're believers or not. Everybody comes up with the same three questions. Where is God? Why did God do this to me? What did I do to deserve this? And there's some reason for that, and that is because there have been times in Scripture where God used wind, and God used fire, and God used earthquake. And so we have built a doctrine out of it and said, whenever there is, and the prophet had to go out and realize, God is not in this wind that is tearing everything apart. God is not in the earthquake that is shaking everything that's solid underneath me. God is not in the fire that's incinerating everything before me. This is an important thing. That that we need to learn in our lives. Because if we believe that God is in all of those things, one of two things is going to happen to us. It's going to make us proud because when we see disaster fall on other people, we'll go, well, they probably deserved it. They're probably great sinners. Look at how God handles people like that. Or if disaster is happening to you, you could feel condemned or absolutely terrified. 
If you, go, if you believe God is in the disaster, it will make you proud or terrified. If you believe God is with you in the disaster, it will make you brave. There's a world of difference between those two things. And so he comes and he's standing there and God's not in it. And then there's a gentle whisper and Elijah knows this is God. It's a whisper only he can hear. It's gentle. It means there's no harshness. There's no sternness. There's no violence. It's soft. It's kind. There's not a shortage of people who are offended to think that God would ever talk like that. They want the angry God. They want the fist pounding, red face yelling to the top of their lungs, bringing all hell down on earth. That's the kind of God they prefer because they assume they're going to do just fine when that happens. Everybody else is going to get theirs, but they're the righteous ones. It's not a good way to live. People who are all about control don't value the kind of God that approaches them with a gentle whisper. So the miraculous showdown with the false prophets didn't protect Elijah from loneliness and the earthquake and the fire and the wind did not remove loneliness from Elijah. Please hear this. God will not speak to us in the way that, that we prefer. He will speak to us in the way that we need. That's how God speaks to us. I know, we believe, if God would just do this, then others would believe. We don't know it's not true. God knows what will help people believe. So I'm gonna ask worship team to come out. So God asks him again, what are you doing here? And his words are almost identical, but I have to believe the tone has changed. What are you doing here? I've been so passionate for you. Your people have rejected you, your promises. They've torn down your altars. When you sent people to help them, they put them to death. I tried to help. I'm not better than any of them. They're trying to put me to death too. And now, now Elijah is ready to hear what God has to say. Now he's ready. Go back the way you came. That's not an easy thing to hear when you want away from the things that you didn't like. Anoint Hazio, king over Aram. Anoint Jehu, king over Israel. Anoint Elisha to succeed you. What is he saying? You are not done. You are not alone. And what you do matters. Would you please hear me today? You are not done. You are not alone. What you do matters. We cannot hear and we will not believe what God has to say when we're exhausted and we're starving and we're mobilized. We cannot determine how God speaks to us or what he will say, but we can allow him to work his process in us. So I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads right now. And I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this. Some of this is going to be so simple and easy it, it will almost offend our concept of a spiritual mind. Some of you today need to schedule rest into your calendar. You need to set your alarm clock later in the morning. You need to plan a nap today. Some of you need to eat some really good food. Maybe you can't get to the restaurant you want but maybe that food can get to you, or maybe you just make a really good meal. I know it'll take a long time and mess up the kitchen and do it anyway. And enjoy the meal when you're eating it. And then get out and take a walk, not just one day, but day after day. And while you're walking, don't listen to podcasts. Don't listen to the news. Don't listen to the things that are driving you insane right now. Well, I don't want to be uninformed. Being informed about the things that are tearing us apart is not real information. 
I wonder what God might whisper to you when you are on a walk and not distracted by something else. I wonder what thoughts you might think if someone else wasn't inserting them into your head for you. And then listen, listen to that gentle whisper. And he's gonna re-engage you. This is not about being an extrovert or an introvert. It's about being connected the way God intends. So Father, help us with this today. We struggle with feeling disconnected and isolated and alone. And there may be people in this room who've actually thought about maybe other people's lives or my life would be better if it were done and they don't want to do life anymore. Would you help us take wisdom from your word and listen for your gentle whisper? In Jesus' name, amen.